In this exercise, we will transfer our knowledge about um, calculating transport properties of quantum dots within a rate equation model to a three-terminal quantum dot. The first part of the problem, first question of this problem, is to write down and solve the rate equations um, for the um, for the system and we um, start doing this by making a little sketch of the two states of the quantum dot. So the two states we consider in this problem are the empty quantum dot and I will call this state zero and the occupied quantum dot and I call this state one. Correspondingly, there will be probabilities for the dot to be in state zero, denoted P zero, and a probability for the dot to be in state one, denoted P one. Since these are the only two states or possibilities um, for the quantum dot state, these two probabilities P zero and P one must sum up to one. So we have the equation P0 plus P1 is equal to 1. This means that these two quantities are not independent from each other. And we need only one additional equation um, that gives us um, explicit expressions for P0. So this is a standard two-state model, which we have started to solve in the excess, uh, in the um, lecture and you also find this solution in the book um, so we will only briefly sketch the um, corresponding equation which reads the change of probability dp1 in time would be given by the sum of two rates first of all if the system is in state zero, and this happens with a probability p0, it may undergo a transition with a rate w from state zero to state one, so we call this w10, and this would increase the probability for being in state one. On the other hand, there can be transitions where the system starts in state one and goes into state zero and these processes will get a negative sign and they will occur with a rate w um, from one to zero. Now solving this equation in the steady state means to have no time dependence of the probability p1 so we solve this equation under the condition that dp1 by dt is equal to zero. And this gives us, gives us the second equation to determine uh, these two probabilities. So we have the normalization condition as the first equation, and we have the steady state rate equation as the second equation. Now it is not so difficult to solve these two equations and we will obtain P0 in terms of the rates which is given by W from 1 to 0 divided by W from 1 to 0 plus W from 0 to 1 and correspondingly P1 is given by W from 0 to 1 divided by the sum of the two. Now, having solved the problem um, up to this stage, the only remaining task is to think about how these rates W01 and W10 can be expressed in terms of um, occupation statistics in the leads and tunneling rates gamma. And 
to this end we write down omega from 0 to 1 this is a process where an electron tunnels into the dot and now of course there are three possibilities to tunnel into the dot from the three different leads and each of these possible tunneling in channels is an alternative to the other so we have to sum up the rates from k equal 1 to 3 all the three leads and for tunneling in we have to consider the tunneling rate gamma k for lead number k and the probability that the state at the energy mu which indicates the energy of the empty dot is in fact occupied. So in turn if we look at transitions w from 1 to 0 then the corresponding rates are again the sum over three leads because now the electron tunnels out from the occupied state and it ends up in an empty state and we need the same tunnel rates gamma k for these processes but now the target state in the leads must be empty so we have the probability 1 minus f k um, of mu for this process to occur. Now at this point we have essentially solved the rate equation model for the occupation probabilities p0 and p1 and we have expressed them with the empirical parameters gamma k, the coupling constants of the dot to the leads, and the lead occupation factors fk, which are Fermi distribution functions evaluated at the energy of the level in the quantum dot. Now, in the second step, we are asked to relate the current through the different terminals of the system to the voltages by a 3x3 three three matrix equation. We will do this on a single line and simply say the current that flows into the system through lead I is given by a linear relation Gij times the voltages applied to terminal J and again we sum over all terminals k equal 1 to 3. So this is a matrix equation because we have the index i running from 1 to 3 through all three leads and here we have all three voltages involved in this sum so we could also write this in matrix form involving a 3 by 3 conductance matrix with elements g i j now the third step consists in writing down these currents in terms of the tunneling rates and for this purpose we have to ask ourselves <coughs> how we measure the current in this system. So consider our three terminal quantum dot like this and now we want to see how we measure the current uh, through terminal I. So suppose this is terminal 1 and we want to know how do we measure the current through terminal 1. In fact what we do is we count electrons that would cross an imaginary boundary between contact 1 and the dot. So electrons tunneling into the dot would be counted as positive current and electrons tunneling out of the dot would be counted as negative currents. So having this picture in mind we can write down the current through any terminal I as E over H 
times the rate for tunneling into the dot. For tunneling into the dot, the dot of course must be first of all empty, so we have p of zero. The state in the lead at energy mu must be occupied, so we will have an, a factor f i at energy mu and then the tunneling process is mediated by the tunnel coupling constant gamma i. So this would be the tunneling in process. Of course electrons could also tunnel out of the quantum dot and this would give a negative contribution to the current because now the current flows in the opposite direction. This requires first of all the dot to be in the occupied state so this happens with the probability p1. It requires the state in the lead to be empty, the target state, so we have 1 minus f of mu and it also involves the coupling constant to lead i gamma So this is the tunneling out contribution to the current. Now having calculated the probabilities of occupation P0 and P1 here and having the tunneling rates W10 and 01 in terms of gamma k and fk we can express the currents in terms of these quantities and the resulting expression so let's say using equation 1 and expressions 2a and 2b we obtain the current as E over H times the sum over all leads K times a product gamma I gamma K divided by the sum of all gammas, let me call this gamma sigma, times the difference fi of mu minus fk of mu. So for completeness we write down gamma sigma as gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3. So in this expression we immediately see that this current that we've calculated for a particular terminal fulfills the requirement that it is zero if the leads in the system, the three leads, are in thermodynamic equilibrium because then they would have exactly the same Fermi distribution functions, so this difference would be zero and we would get no current in the system. So a finite current requires that there is non-equilibrium between the three terminals in the system. So in the next step we want to calculate this current in linear response. The reason is that for this expression that we've written down here we need currents to be proportional to the voltages. Now this can only be achieved if this difference in Fermi distribution functions is Taylor expanded for small differences. 
So this will be our step number four. So we will express the difference fi of mu minus fk of mu for small differences in the electrochemical potentials of the two contacts i and k as the derivative df by d mu evaluated at mu is equal to mu zero and evaluated of course at the energy given by the mu of the dot times the difference of mu um, i minus mu k. Now the difference of these electrochemical potentials in the leads is given by the negative elementary or the elementary charge of the electron minus e minus e times the voltage difference vi minus vk. So you see if we now use this expansion for this difference we obtain expressions that are proportional to voltage and these expressions will then appear in the current up here. Now of course we would like to express this derivative of the Fermi function in a more convenient form and this can be worked out. That's something I will not show here. It gives 1 over 4 times the Boltzmann constant times temperature times the hyperbolic cosine squared of mu in the dot minus a reference level mu zero divided by two times the Boltzmann constant times temperature. So this is the derivative, there is a minus sign and there is the elementary charge times the voltage difference Vi minus Vk. So at this point we have rediscovered, if you like, a resonance line shape this 1 divided by hyperbolic cosine squared function gives a resonant maximum at a position mu zero um, and the width of this resonance is determined by temperature. So this shows us already the answer to question number five. Since this factor here appears in the currents for all leads, the resonance will be the same for the currents in all leads. The resonance will appear at the same gate voltage for all lead currents. Now, what I've left out here is the step where we essentially insert this expression into the expression for the current and then look for these coefficients gij. 
let me um, show you the result for gij as an example you will find e squared over h now you find a factor which is equal to the derivative of the Fermi distribution so 1 divided by 4 kbt times the hyperbolic cosine squared mu minus mu 0 divided by 2 kbt then there is this prefactor gamma i gamma j divided by um, gamma sigma and the difference in the voltages of course drops out because the conductances already have are the coefficients of the voltage um, linear voltage terms so this is essentially the expression for the conductance that you find and it is valid for off-diagonal elements i is not equal to j. Remember that the diagonal elements of the conductivity or conductance matrix are the sum of either the row or column off-diagonal elements. Now the last question posed in this problem is the question what determines the width of the resonances and that's a question I've already answered before the width of the resonance is essentially determined by the 1 over hyperbolic cosine squared term and it is determined by temperature width of resonance determined by temperature T and if you want to work out a more precise value you may want to state what is the um, full width of the peak at half maximum value and you will find the full width at half maximum is approximately given by 3.55 Boltzmann constant times temperature.